Is it safe to come out now? <gasps> Maybe not. Let's kill this. There's always a plan B. Hi, good morning. Welcome to worship with the Universalist Unitarian Church of Peoria. My name is Reverend Jennifer Innes. My pronouns are she and her. And I have the pleasure of serving as the minister with this congregation of people of all ages at all stages of life. This is a beloved community striving to live into its mission of embracing freedom, loving wholeheartedly, 
growing in mind, body, and spirit, and adding to the wholeness and the healing of the world. We are. We are unapologetically progressive. Yes! In case you didn't know what this service is about, we're going to live into that today. As we welcome people of all ethnicities and races, sexual orientation and gender identities, social and economic situations and abilities, and politics, we are engaged with the work of our time as we advocate for human rights and are good stewards of this earth. So in living our mission, we recognize the network of relationships of which we are a part. This is the ancestral home of the Peoria people. They and other nations were here long before the first European settlers came down the river. And at the Peoria people's request, we take a moment during worship to honor them for who they were and for who they are today. I want to thank everybody for joining us in person and online. We keep learning how precious it is to be together, to add to our circles of care and kindness. So if you are new to us today, please help us get to know you. We have an unending supply of name tags, and we are happy to answer all the questions. I invite everybody to stay for coffee and conversation. If you're in person in Fellowship Hall, if you're on Zoom, they are staying after the service. Uh, I want to take a moment to invite folks to check your respective devices that they are in worship mode. We see the graphic on the slide if you need a little help and reminder of how to do that. We are both Mac and Android. Or ask a neighbor in the sanctuary for help because we serve each other, right? I have a note about our altar and flowers for this month. For today, I want to thank Judith Corn Shanahan for the decorations for this month. But I also want to point out the beautiful flowers that we have for this coming sun for this Sunday. These come from the Picket Fence Foundation. They are our Share the Plate recipient for this month. And these flowers are their expression of thanks to us, and they are just lovely. So, yes. So this morning, it is our pleasure to welcome our guest, Heather Vickery, from the Unitarian Universalist Service Committee. Heather, whose pronouns are she and her, is the coordinator for congregational activism at the UU Service Committee and works with congregations and state networks uh, who want to do social justice work more faithfully and effectively. And she's also part of the Congregational Accompaniment Project for Asylum Seekers known as CAPIS, sometimes an acronym can be very useful, CAPIS, that matches and supports congregations with asylum seekers who need sponsorship. And are very, in particular right now, working with our trans partners to help folks be more safe. She also is an active member of her Unitarian Universalist Congregation First Parish in Malden, Massachusetts. As a Massachusetts native, it is lovely to welcome a little, a little visit from Massachusetts. And Heather's also an aspirant for, uh, for our Unitarian Universalist ministry. So welcome, Heather. Thank you. I want to invite folks to stay for coffee and conversation after service. Please stay uh, for our potluck in Fellowship Hall, um, because after we've had a chance to eat and visit for a minute, Heather will have us um, offer a more specific conversation of how we can be tangibly helpful to our trans and non-binary neighbors who are trying to get to safer places. I also want to note, we have some good stuff happening today. We also have, wait for it, the Girl Scout cookies are back. Yes! This is our Girl Scout cookie sale today. By all means, please support. We, all the scouts get together and then divide up the number um, between themselves. Or thank you to Jesse Lachlan for coordinating this. And also as a note, in case you needed more reason to buy a cookie or make a donation, the Girl Scouts are totally trans and non-binary friendly too. So here we are. Uh, I also want to offer that coming up this week, we have we have the long-awaited and had to be delayed chili cook-off is coming on Saturday evening, this coming Saturday. Uh, 
we had wonderful and food and camaraderie last year. We want to have some great options uh, for this year. Sign up to bring some chili uh, and maybe, let me just offer this as an incentive, if you have to do cooking for Super Bowl, get that done a day ahead, right? Because chili is always better the next day, so it will even be even better for the big game. Uh, see Joyce Rosenberger if you have any questions. I really want to encourage folks to sign up. It's going to be a great time. Also, as part of the congregation, we are seeking your input and imagination on how this congregation can deepen its life and fulfill its mission. So we are in the moment of having a five-year planning conversation. Over the past few couple of weekends, we've had some very productive and lively congregations about our priorities for the next five years. So you are welcome to fill out a short, I tell you it's one page, not that many questions, short questionnaire on paper or online. Uh, see Regina Stanley for a copy or see the recent emails for the link. We want to have folks return those uh, questionnaires completed by February 11th, so next Sunday. That'll give the planning team time to get thoughts together and present to the board later this month. All right. Now we have done all the things, so let's get into the singing for this moment. I want to invite you to rise and body your spirit for hymn number 188. It's come, come whoever you are. I might have put it wrong in the order of service, but it's really the right number. So it's come, come whoever you are with the counterpoint. And let me offer that a little bit today. I'm going to have to be at the pulpit because the, the earbud is not working. So. The counterpoint is where we have, though you've broken your vows a thousand times. So I'm going to lead you through that for a moment, and then we'll lead through the verse, and then Sher uh, Sherry will sing it all together. <laughs> though you've broken your vows a thousand times, though you've broken your vows a thousand times, though you've broken your vows a thousand times, Great. Now for the verse. Come, come, whoever you are, wanderer, worshiper, lover of the evening, ours is no caravan of despair. Come, yet again, come. Great. We're going to sing the counterpoint three times and then we'll go into the verse three times. And they don't combine. I'm sorry? They don't combine. Well, one. Yes, combine. On all the verses? Or? You're... Uh, yes. Okay. Yeah. So we're starting with the counterpoint. Yes, please. Okay. <laughs>
I'll open us today with these words by Tanya Marquez. It is now when we are called as witnesses of the world to mend it, to change its course, to restore it. It is now when we are called to act on our values, not to hide, not to fear, but to be bold and loud. It is now that we are called to continue our fight for justice, to organize, to speak up. It is now. Let us gather, let us give each other courage, let us worship. Let me invite the Jones family forward to light our chalice this morning. When we gather together, we light the chalice, a symbol of our Unitarian Universalist faith. The chalice reminds us that we are connected to a much larger religious tradition that stretches out of the past, reaches around the world, and leans into our shared future. Let us take this time together to be open to forgiveness and be forgiven. Let us be open to diversity and be accepted. Let us be open to expression and be understood. Let us be open to compassion and be loved. Let us be open to awareness and be known. Let us be open to sharing, to exchange, to possibility, to awakening, and be hopeful. Let us be open to gratitude and be blessed. As we enter into this moment for meditation, you are welcome to come forward, light a candle, do an intentional act to mark what is in your mind and on your heart. Let us enter into our music for meditation.
Now is the time for the sharing of joys and sorrows, names and milestones among us. I invite us to extend our circle of care to Mary Mahal and Kafar, all the way over uh, in Iowa and Minnesota, and her wife, Marcia. Marcia's health and circumstances continue to be a challenge. We offer strength to Mary as she visits Marcia this week. We offer wishes for health and recovery to Donna Dalrymple. Donna is recovering from a small stroke that she had this week. Now we turn, we turn to sympathy. We offer our sympathy to Regina Stanley and her family for the death of Regina's grandmother, Catherine Evans. Catherine died yesterday at age 99. She was in the loving embrace of her family. From the photos, I can tell where Regina and Riley get their spark. We offer also sympathy and support to Sherry Campbell for the death of her husband, Gary. Sherry wrote that Gary passed away on Friday. He lost his life to a hard fought battle with cancer. He was 73, and over the years, he helped with numerous Christmas Eve services and a few rummage sales. He carried so much gratitude in his heart for all the friendships, kind words, and the help he was so lovingly given by members of the congregation. He passed away at home with Sherry by his side as he wished. They married in 1976. Let us offer our sympathy to Sherry and all who knew love and loved Gary. In our larger world, we recognize this point on the wheel of the year as Imbolc, the feast known as of St. Bridget and Candlemas. Let us bless the earth and all that is steady and firm. Let us bless the sky and all that is open and filled with light. Let us bless their union, holy and without ceasing. Let us bless their children, the bounty of field and forest, stones, plants, animals, all living things. May the gifts of earth and sky strengthen, refresh, nourish, and heal all the peoples of the earth. And we close with the recognition that this is the beginning of Black History Month, knowing that every day is also about black history, not just one month. Let us take one more moment in reflection, in shared quiet together. Let us take one more moment and breathe and be present <clears throat> to this moment. I invite you to breathe with me. <clears throat> Amen, shalom, and blessed be. I invite Jesse forward to offer our story for this morning. <clears throat> Today's story is when Aiden became a brother. We know getting a new sibling is a big event. When Aiden was born, everyone thought he was a girl. His parents gave him a pretty name. His room looked like a girl's room, and he wore clothes that other girls liked wearing. 
But as Aiden got bigger, he hated the sound of his name. He felt his room belonged to someone else, and he always ripped or stained his clothes accidentally on purpose. Everyone thought he was a different kind of girl. Some girls had rooms full of science experiments and bug collections, and lots of girls didn't wear dresses. But Aiden didn't feel like any kind of girl. He was really another kind of boy. It was hard to tell his parents what he knew about himself, but it would have been even harder not to. It took everyone some time to adjust, and they all learned a lot from other families with transgender kids like him. Aiden explored different ways of being a boy. He tried out lots of names until one finally stuck, and they changed his bedroom to a place where he felt like he belonged. He also took much better care of his new clothes. Then, one day, Mom and Dad had something to tell him. I'm going to have a baby, Mom announced. A baby, Aiden said. Does that mean I get to be a big brother? Of course, said Dad. Aiden thought that was a very important job. The baby needed clothes, so Aiden and his mom went shopping. Would the baby want seahorses or penguins? Hmm. Are you having a boy or girl? asked a lady. Aiden didn't like it when people asked him that question. He really hoped the baby didn't hear. He was glad when mom just smiled and said, I'm having a baby. The baby's room needed to be painted, so Aiden and his dad went to the hardware store and chose a gallon of sky blue paint and puffy cloud white. The big rollers were fun to paint with. This room feels just like being outside. Aiden had always felt trapped in his bedroom before they fixed it, and he hoped his sibling would never feel that way. Every baby needs a name. Aiden loved getting to choose his own. So he helped his parents look for one that could fit this new person whoever they grew up to be. Babies need someone to read to them. So Aiden practiced and practiced and practiced. Dad wanted to teach Aiden how to change diapers, but uh, maybe later, Aiden said. He decided picking flowers for mom was more important. Two weeks before the baby's due date, Aiden started to worry. Maybe he should have picked different clothes. Maybe the blue walls were too bright. He wished he could ask the baby which name he liked they liked best. Mom came to tuck him in. Are you feeling okay, sweetie? She asked. Aiden put his hands where he thought the baby's ears might be and said, do you think the baby will be happy with everything? What if I got everything wrong? What if I don't know how to be a good big brother? Mom hugged him tight. 
When you were born, we didn't know you were going to be our son. We made some mistakes. But you helped us fix them. You taught us how important it is to love someone for exactly who they are. This baby is so lucky to have you, and so are we. The next morning, Aiden found the boxes of his old baby pictures. He looked so different back then. He liked the boy he was growing into. Maybe everything wouldn't be perfect for this new baby. Maybe he would have to fix mistakes he didn't even know that he was making. And maybe that was okay. Aiden knew how to love someone, and that was the most important thing about being a big brother. I know I've made mistakes. I wonder how you can let other people fix their mistakes. Hmm. The kids and youth are invited back for religious education. Let me invite Regina up for offering the reading this morning. It is good to have all the traffic with the children and youth. This is a good thing. Yay. <clears throat> We're going to do the offering first. You know, we're just going to own the process. Good morning. Give me a moment. Just when you think you know what you're doing. All right. So for this moment, this is one of our moments of intentional action and intentional gratitude where we receive a morning offering during our service because we could make the donation, and many people do, at all these other times during the week. But we do so in this moment because it is something to be said for recognizing the expression of thanks and the expression of gratitude that is in when we make a donation, making a gift of something that can be larger than any one of us can do alone. And we also, as part of that practice of abundance, do uh, share part of our plate. And in this case, we share uh, one-third of the undesignated offering in our uh, weekly uh, donations. We share that with a recipient every month uh, through our Share the Plate program. And for February, we have the Picket Fence Foundation is our recipient. I point out we have the lovely flowers from them in recognition today, because they provide employment and training opportunities for adults with disabilities, and sets an example of disability inclusion for other businesses. And it includes their work as a gift shop, a floral studio, a garden center, a greenhouse, and just a variety of places and ways to learn skills and to be in a workplace. So the Picket Fence Foundation is our recipient for this month. I invite you to offer something in the envelope or go to the QR code online. And as you do so, I invite you, uh, the ushers will come forward or receive the offering during the next music. Thank you, and let me invite the ushers to please come forward.
Troublemaker Blessing, adapted from Lore Stevens and Cody Hooks. We are the holy troublemakers, the mystics and misfits, the doubters and devil worshipers, the Afrofuturists and magical realists, the so-called heretics, heathens, and hedonists. Hell, even the kinks and trekkies fit under this sparkly umbrella. No category can contain us. We're basically everything else. We are the pesky shadow sewn to the feet of all great traditions, teachings, and institutions. We embody the, the eternal unknown, the stubborn mysteries, the uncontrollable forces of nature. We are human prisms, breaking plain white light into a riot of color. The monsters under the bed, who remind you that there's as much to be learned from the sacred darkness as there is the light. We are the mischievous seekers who demand to know why, how come, what's the point? Our only doctrine is that no truth is the whole truth. No way is the one right way. We celebrate the queers, the forbidden lovers, the shapeshifters, the box breakers. Thank you for creating the unimaginable just by being your outrageous selves. We celebrate the pagans, the witches, folk healers, midwives, and death doulas, those whose allegiance is first and foremost to this dirty, bloody, beautiful planet Earth. Thank you for keeping humanity's feet on the ground and our eyes on the stars. We celebrate the atheists, agnostics, and non-believers. Thank you for laughing at the powerful and for doubting absolutely everything with such gleeful fierceness. We invite all to plant the ancient, ancient seeds of questions. May they bloom into fabulous futures. Bless the world with your unique imperfections, your change, your holy failure, your sacred resurrections. May you wake every morning with stardust in your eyes. Oh, little universe, may you love forever. Please rise and body your spirit for our hymn number 131, Love Will Guide Us. It is in the gray hymnal if you like the music.
I am so happy to be here with you all on this cold, beautiful Sunday. As an aspirant for UU Ministry, and in my role as coordinator for congregational activism at UUSC, I get to preach in a lot of different UU congregations. And let me tell you, each congregation does things a little bit differently, which makes sense. I mean, we UUs are kind of known for loving to argue and disagree about practically anything. Uh, there are even UU jokes about it, and I'm going to start our time together with a few of those. So the first one, a Unitarian Universalist died and to his surprise discovered that there was indeed an afterlife. The angel in charge of things told him, because you are an unbeliever and a doubter and a skeptic, you will be sent to hell for all eternity, which in your case consists of a place where no one will ever disagree with you again. <laughs> the second one, visitors on a tour of heaven noticed a group of Unitarian Universalists who were arguing about whether they were really there or not. And the third one, a visitor to a Unitarian Universalist church sat through a sermon with growing incredulity at the heretical ideas being spouted. After the sermon, a UU asked the visitor, so how'd you like it? I can't believe half the things that minister said, sputtered the visitor in outrage. All good, then you'll fit right in. <laughs> so honestly, I love pretty much all UU jokes, but especially the ones about how much we love to argue and disagree about things. We have eight principles and an infinite number of ways to interpret them. We agree on a lot, but love to get into the nitty gritty about what we're not so sure of. And I think we can all agree that as a faith, we actually love being unsure. We lean into it, and that's a beautiful thing. We understand that we're a learning and not a learned faith, and that healthy disagreement produces growth and keeps us from being dogmatic about things that we and in fact, no one can know for sure. However, there's one thing that solidly connects all you use. As I've said, I've been to congregations across the country and none of them worship the same. But in every single congregation, there is a chalice and that chalice is lit to begin worship. Now you might be thinking, I thought this worship was going to be about how our faith calls us to support our trans beloveds in these times of fascist threats against their humanity. The chalice and you, you jokes don't have anything to do with that. Well, first, to come full circle, I disagree. And second, I promise I will explain more, and maybe something that never happens in a you, you service will happen today. You all will end up agreeing with me. It is the chalice itself, the very thing that binds all you use together, that most strongly calls us to the work of resisting the criminalization of our trans and gender expansive beloveds. You see, our chalice, as sacred as it is to us, wasn't always the symbol of the Unitarian and Universalist faiths. In 1940, Reverend Dr. Charles Ryan Joy was sent by the newly created Unitarian Service Committee, the predecessor to the current UUSC, to Lisbon, Portugal, which was the only open port in Europe at the time and was the preferred port for the many refugees that were fleeing the Nazi regime. Many of the refugees had to flee without any of the identification papers that were required to cross borders. So Joy decided to start making identification papers issued by the USC itself. This was uncharted waters, but instead of focusing on the risks that he and the organization might be taking by doing this, Joy focused on saving the lives of those fleeing fascism. He also decided that the papers needed a seal to look as official as other travel papers. And so he asked Hans Dutch, an Austrian refugee and artist working in Lisbon, to create one. And the result was the basis of the flaming chalice as we now know it. While this was happening, by the way, Waitzel and Martha Sharp were also sent to Europe by the USC. And they not only falsified documents to get people out, but also laundered money if necessary. So you see, the thing that binds us all as Unitarian Universalists is the chalice. And it was founded on our commitment to human rights 
and to fighting fascism. Since the founding of the Unitarian Universalist Service Committee, we've been committed to supporting the work of liberation, even when, and maybe especially when, it involves making holy trouble for the powers that would deny anyone's full humanity. Okay, let's take a quick breath together. This is where we get into the heavy stuff, so no more jokes, sorry. I want to invite you all to do whatever you need to care for yourself and stay grounded as we proceed. If you need to stand up and stretch, walk to the back of the sanctuary, look at your phones, yes, even that, I promise I will not be insulted. Please take care of yourselves. Talking about the present nature of fascism in our country can be incredibly triggering for anyone. To my trans and queer family in the room, this invitation especially goes out to you. So to understand what fascism is, I'm gonna reference the work of Jason Stanley, who's the author of How Fascism Works, The Politics of Us and Them. Stanley is a professor of schol and scholar of philosophy and propaganda at Yale. And he describes fascism as an ideology, but also, and perhaps more importantly, as a political method. Not all who use fascist tactics are ideologically fascist. We recognize fascists less by their beliefs than by their methods. And I'm gonna share Stanley's overview of the 10 tactics of political fascism. What I'm sharing with you now is directly, or taken directly from Stanley's work, at times word for word, um, from a video lecture he gave titled The 10 Tactics of Fascism, which is available on YouTube if anyone wants to check out the whole thing. So Stanley opens by explaining that these 10 tactics are bundled together, that they can't be isolated from each other. So the first is a mythic past. Fascists always present the idea that there was once a glorious past. In politics, this is presented in the idea that we were once a great nation, notice the past tense. And when we were great, the dominant racial group ruled over others. But now that's been taken away not lost by our own actions, but taken away by some group designated as other. Jason Stanley says fascists are always telling a story about a glorious past that's been lost and they tap into that nostalgia. So when you fight back against fascism, you've got one hand tied behind your back because the truth is messy and complex and the mythical story is always clear and compelling and entertaining. And it's hard to undercut that with facts. The second tactic is propaganda. Now, all social movements and all po politics use propaganda to persuade. Fascist propaganda, however, makes a distinguish, distinction, sorry, we're really practicing the imperfection today, between friends and enemies. It casts the other as a threat and presents the idea that these others are fundamentally opposed to the nation. Tactic three anti-intellectualism. Authoritarianism presents a cult of the leader. In a fascist system, the leader and only the leader sets the rules about what is true or false. So we see the takeover of the country's media, schools, and cultural institutions to enforce what the leader says is true. That brings us directly to tactic number four, the creation of a form of unreality. The scholar Timothy Snyder talks about this a lot, the destruction of notions of reality. Authoritarians undermine what we know to be true and convince the population that A, everyone is lying, and B, the lies don't matter. In political terms, the center of democracy is truth. You cannot function as a democratic citizen if you're being lied to. The fifth tactic is hierarchy. Hierarchy is absolutely central to fascism. It is the big lie at the center of things. White supremacy, male supremacy, abled supremacy, these lies assign people superiority and the privileges and benefits that go with that superiority. And hierarchy goes right into the sixth tactic of victimhood. Once you've convinced people that they are justifiably higher in the hierarchy, then you can convince them that they are victims of equality. 
Fascists tell people that equality is victimizing them by making them lose their rightful place of power. Stanley says the goal is to make people feel like victims, to make them feel like they've lost something, and that the thing they've lost has been taken from them by a specific enemy, usually some minority outgroup or some opposing nation. The seventh tactic of fascism is law and order. Under fascism, the definition of law abiding means loyalty to the dominant group. Members of the dominant group, by their very nature, are considered law abiding. Marginalized groups are seen by their very nature as not being law abiding. And law and order has nothing to do with justice or equality. Law and order structures who is legitimate and who is not. And law and order will ultimately be enforced by violence. Tactic number eight is sexual anxiety. In every case across different cultural and historical settings, the fascist leader will always say, your women and children are under threat. You need a strong man to protect your families. Fascists make conservatives overwhelmingly terrified of transgender rights and gay and lesbian and bisexual people and their families. According to fascists, these targeted groups are not simply trying to peacefully live their own lives. They're, destroy, they're trying to destroy the majority's life, and they're coming for the majority's children. Stanley calls the ninth tactic of fascism Sodom and Gomorrah. Fascist movements typically rest on an urban-rural divide, and fascists use a, tropi- a toxic trope of the biblical story of Sodom and Gomorrah. In this trope, pure, hardworking, real Americans or members of the nation, live in rural areas where they work hard with their hands. But when politicians talk about inner city voters or urban voters, we all know what they mean. Black and queer folks, immigrants, Jews, and other people that fascists seek to control and eliminate. The 10th tactic is what Stanley, a child of Holocaust survivors, calls Arbeit Mach Fry, work shall set you free. These words were hung over the gate at Auschwitz. Fascists create an idea that minorities, immigrants, and others are lazy, that these groups need to be taught a work ethic. The mechanism they use is forced labor, whether it's prison labor or work requirements for benefits. The targeted group must provide free labor as a supposed moral education. According to fascist labor unions are supposedly run by communists who are trying to make things easier for these lazy people. College students who protest conservative speakers are described as lazy spoiled kids who need to get real jobs. And the thing is the end game in this calculation is pure evil. Valuing people by how hard they work means that the elderly, disabled, and even children can become disposable. The Nazis murdered these groups first because they believed that those who could not work had no value. Is it any wonder that we are now seeing the repeal of child labor laws in this time of rising fascism? Those are Stanley's 10 tactics of fascism. Very long quote over. So friends, let's take another breath. No doubt, You recognize many, if not all, of these tactics at work today in the United States. Currently in the US, anti-LGBTQ rhetoric and legislation seems to be one of the few issues that brings disparate factions of conservatives together and right-wing politicians are leaning in hard. 38 states currently have anti-transgender legislation on their books with the number of new bills growing by the day. The ACLU is currently tracking 278 anti-LGBTQI bills that are in process for the 2024 legislative season in various state legislatures. Some of them you would be surprised to know. And most of these are anti-trans laws. There are also 38 national bills being proposed. 
These bills threaten our trans and gender expansive beloveds in many ways, some of which include transgenocide through legal definitions, which seek to erase trans folks from public life and remove any protections they may have, the expansion of anti-LGBTQI propaganda laws, which apply to libraries, schools, and the internet, and child custody and removal laws that would allow the state or other family members to take children from trans parents or from parents who are honoring their child's gender identity. The lies and misinformation surrounding these bills are abhorrent. These bills are trying to legislate trans and queer people out of existence. And please know that this is not hyperbole. We know that this is the ultimate goal as well because of, a, because of Project 2025, which is the right's published plan to reshape the executive branch if they win the next presidential election. One of their first acts would be to institute a nationwide don't say gay policy through executive order. Because of these laws, trans people in the United States now meet the definition of internally displaced peoples, or IDPs, by the United Nations. Hundreds of thousands of trans people and their families have already fled their homes to safer states, with more than a million considering doing so, according to a recent Data for Progress survey. So let's take another breath. There are so many questions we can ask ourselves in light of the current situation. What do we do? Who do we want to be? How do we resist and even find joy in times like these? And I think many of us look back at times like the Holocaust and have thought, if I was there, I would have done something. Well, folks, we're there. What is the something we are going to do? What is the something you are going to do? Earlier this year, an organization led by trans activists approached UUSC and asked if we could help trans folks relocate to safer states. They saw the work that UUSC is doing with congregations in supporting asylum seekers, and wondered if UUs had the networks, infrastructure, and desire to support a different kind of asylum seeker, ones driven from their US-based homes and communities. In this work with trans activists, we are in an interfaith coalition with Quakers, Jews, Mennonites, the United Church of Christ, and much more. We're exploring partnerships with mutual aid networks and anyone else who is saying, no, I will not let this happen, not on my watch. We are working together to create networks of safety and direct support for trans beloveds and their families who need to relocate, access healthcare across state lines, or stay as safe as possible where they are. Because of the safety concerns for these trans organizers and the people they are serving, we're prioritizing their security above all, which is allowing us to move together in deep trust during these crucial, frightening times. This is why we're not sharing the names of any organizers or passengers or even the trans-led organization that is leading us in this work. Instead, we've come up with the name Pink Haven Coalition to talk about the action we're taking together. And we still avoid sharing this work on social media or on large listservs because these organizations and the Activists involved are already regularly experiencing doxing attempts, which is when people try to get personal information and spread it out, and death threats and other violent threats. And we want to delay our partners becoming a target for as long as possible. And this also creates a challenge in mobilizing UUs and like-minded justice lovers. Our requests for assistance have to be through networks that are trusted and somewhat closed. And that's why I'm bringing this to you here today, my friends. So I'm gonna talk about three important ways you can get involved in this critical work. Get involved as a volunteer. We're looking for people to be part of villages of support. We need hosts to offer space in their homes and we need volunteers to provide support in navigating government programs, 
accessing health care, finding employment, and establishing social connections. This is incredibly important in Illinois, especially because you are a safer state with a decent cost of living. By joining forces, we can provide a safer exodus and a welcoming community for those settling in our area. Make a gift. These efforts to support our trans beloveds require financial resources. Your contributions will help us address the practical needs of those seeking sanctuary, respond to their immediate needs, and set them up for success in their new lives. The First Parish in Malden, Mass. has generally offered to act as fiscal sponsor for this work. And if you can, I encourage you to give as abundantly and courageously as you can by visiting www.pinkhaven.org and clicking donate. The third way that you can take action is to skill up. We are all in different places on our justice journeys. Some of us here are trans or gender expansive, and this is your lived reality. Others of us may be new to the wonderful world that awaits beyond the gender binary. For those of us who may not fully understand all the terms and complexities of gender and maybe worry about not knowing what to say or saying the wrong thing, I urge you to lean into your discomfort and support these individuals and families anyways. Explore resources that increase your competency in, that, in this arena. Reach out to me if you need some ideas. Pretty much nothing would make me happier. Join me after the service to talk more about this work um, at coffee hour or at the potluck. And keep your eye open for other ways and opportunities for being in solidarity with our trans and gender expansive beloveds as we move through this next year. Friends, the forces of fascism in our nation and in others around the world are only going to grow more brazen in their quest for power. It's up to us to pay attention, disrupt the violence, and remain true to who we are as justice-loving people of faith. As the late John Lewis advised, do not get lost in a sea of despair. Do not become bitter or hostile. Be hopeful. Be optimistic. Never, ever be afraid to make some noise and get in some good trouble, necessary trouble. We will find a way to make a way out of no way. So I am calling all you holy troublemakers to join us, to rise up and say, we will not fall in line. We will not let this happen. We will make so much holy, troublesome noise that we will drown out the sounds of hate and fear and fascism. Together, we can and will find a way out of no way. Now is the time. We are the ones we've been waiting for. Amen. Ashe. And let it be so. Please rise and body your spirit for our closing hymn, number 1017, Building a New Way. It is in our teal hymnal if you like the music.
Received from Reverend Peggy Clark. Knowing how quickly the flame of truth may be extinguished, how easily the chalice of fellowship broken, let us be vigilant in faith, keep peace in our hearts, and make care for one another. The watchword of our lives together, so our light goes out everywhere into the world. Let this benediction take you into the week. The words are by Elena Westbrook. Go in hope, for the arc of the universe is long, and we can bend it towards justice. Go in courage, for together we have the strength to confront injustice in our daily lives and the larger world. Go in love, because a holy and generous love is both the reason and the means by which we transform our lives. Our worship is ended. Let our service begin. <laughs>